Ms. Robert Hatzenbichler. Thank you for joining uh, my talk on the microbial ecology of extremophiles, of extreme loving microorganisms on International Microorganism Day. Um, I'm an assistant professor at Montana State University's Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, and I'm also affiliated professor at the Thermal Biology Institute and the Center for Biofilm Engineering here in beautiful Bozeman, Montana. For those of you who do not know where Bozeman is, um, Bozeman is located on, you know, the southern side of uh, Montana and according to Star Trek lore, at least according to the movie Star Trek 8, it will be the site of the first contact between humans and the Vulcans in the year 2063. It's a small city of about 50,000 uh, inhabitants with a big university with about 15-ish, 20,000 um, students, undergraduates and graduate students. And we actually, in fact, the closest university uh, to Yellowstone National Park, which is also what I want to talk to you about today, microorganisms in the extreme features of Yellowstone National Park. Before we go to Yellowstone National Park together, I first want to give you a quick introduction of what environmental microbiologists like myself are doing. So the questions an environmental microbiologist has whenever we see a new microorganism the, the same questions that you would ask a person when you, met, when you meet them for the first time. Who are you? What are you doing? When are you doing that? Where are you located? And where do you do your job? With whom do you typically hang out with? Who are your friends? Who are your enemies? Who are your frenemies? And how many of you are there in the environmental sample or in the environment? And so traditionally how environmental microbiologists have approached these kind of questions was to uh, using cultivation approaches. So we went into the environment of interest, we took a sample that could be, you know, a soil sample or a water sample. And we you know we tried to grow microorganisms from that sample on a Petri dish or in an Elmeyer flask in the lab. So we provided some artificial growth medium in a Petri dish. You know, we provided them with energy sources, with carbon sources and so on. We, you know, made life as cozy as possible for these organisms in the lab and then, you know, just waited a few days and then, you know, waited up which microorganisms might be growing up in these, you know, colonies of bacteria that were growing up on the Arga plate and then try to identify who they are and then, you know, what are they doing and so on. There's a problem, however, and that is that the majority of organisms that we know out there cannot be grown in the lab. So if I would plot all the microorganisms you know, that we know exist out there and only show the fraction of the ones that we can actually grow in the lab under artificial conditions, we would see that about only 1% on average of any microorganisms we know out there can be grown in the lab. But the majority of them is what is called the microbial dark matter in a term that we you know, borrowed from astrophysics or the uncultured majority that makes up you know, the majority of microorganisms in the human microbiome, in seawater, in sediments, in pretty much any habitat you can think of. The majority of organisms, we know that are out there, but we cannot grow them in the lab. And to show you a little bit what big of a problem this really is, is I want to give you the example of soil. If you go outside and scoop up some soil, you will have about five grams of soil worth on your little spoon. In one gram of this soil, there live about a billion different microorganisms that are affiliated with bacteria, with archaea, or are members of the eukaryotes. To put this number into perspective, our galaxy has about 100 billion stars. In the soil, this one gram of soil that we just scooped up, has about 10,000 to 100,000 different species of microorganisms. To put this into perspective, on the entire planet Earth, we have about 6,000 different mammal species. So we're talking about gigantic numbers here. And, you know, the Earth is obviously not only composed of soil, there's many different habitat types in every one of which, as we just showed before, the majority of microorganisms cannot be grown in the lab. I first want to talk a little bit about why that is. Why is it so hard for us microbial ecologists and environmental microbiologists to replicate the conditions in the lab? And why some of the lessons we can learn by studying microorganisms directly in the lab are, you know, ultimately limited. And I want to give you this example of a lion. What food is a, fa is a lion eating? What, you know, how is, it, is, how, is it, how is a lion interacting with its environment? What you will do is you will go into the Serengeti and you will observe a lion. What are they doing? What you will not do is you will not try to 
capture a lion in the wild, bring it back into a zoo, put it into captivity, and then feed it a chicken. Because that condition is obviously not how a lion is living in the wild. But this is exactly what we are doing if we try to go to an environment and try to isolate an organism from its environment and grow it in the lab under artificial conditions. What you learn is still important. You still learn something about the biology of the organism, right? In this case, you learn that a lion eats a chicken. Of course, the lion will eat the chicken. Does that mean that the chicken is the natural prey for the lion? No, of course it's not, right? And so it is very, very important to keep that in mind for microbiology. What you read in a textbook about microbiology, right, has been done by studying organisms in captivity in a glass beaker that is shaking at 200 rounds per minute in a lab somewhere. This is not how the organism is growing in its natural environment. And this is what we as environmental microbiologists want to do. We want to understand what is the organism doing in the real world, in the real conditions where it's hanging out with you know, thousands and thousands of other species. The other problem is that organisms, microorganisms, just as animals, have activity patterns. Some of them are dormant during the day, some of them are active during the day, some of them are active in the night, and some of them you know, can be dormant for quite a long time. There have been some microorganisms found in deep sea sediments that apparently have been dormant for millions of years. But if the conditions switch to the right, that the environment suddenly you know, um, has, a, has a burst of nutrients that you know, flowed into the environment, suddenly the microorganisms become active because you know, the condition changed for the better. The same concept obviously applies in zoology, right? We would never assume that all organisms are only active during a particular time of the day. Of course not. Everyone has their particular environmental niche. And the same is true for microorganisms. By growing them in isolation, in a beaker, you ignore all of that. You take this out of its natural conditions. What are we studying or which kind of microorganisms are we studying in, in, in Yellowstone National Park? Why do we study hot springs to begin with? The first one is we know that hot springs resemble life's earliest habitat. At the, you know, at the start, after the formation of the Earth, after the Earth cooled down to allow liquid water um, on its surface, Earth was pretty hot still, right? We are talking about you know, 80, 90, 100 boiling temperatures of water temperature. And this is the habitat where the early life forms, the first microorganisms formed. So by studying extant life in hot springs, we learn something about the origin of life, the origin of cells in the ancient habitat where Earth evolved 3.5 to 4 billion years ago. And we learn what the implications of that are for astrobiology. So for the study of life um, in the universe, are there any other planets, any other celestial bodies out there that could also be home to, to alien life forms. And by studying the extremes of life on the planet Earth, we can learn what are the extremes that we can expect on other planets, like for example, planet Mars, or when we talk about hot environments, we typically talk about, you know, the Jupiter moons, like um, Europa, where we think there is, you know, um, deep sea hydrothermal vents on these moons. Another reason is that, as I just mentioned before, the uh, majority of microorganisms on the planet cannot be grown in the lab, and 99% of the life on the planet is microbial. So 99% of the 99% of life on the planet can, are microorganisms that cannot be grown in the lab. So if we go to the environments that provide the most extreme conditions, we can explore the entire scale of diversity of life that exists on the planet. We want to look at the deepest you know, habitats on the planet in the deep sea. We want to look at the coldest places in glaciers in Antarctica. And we want to learn about life in geothermal hot springs that are on the other side of the temperature spectrum. And the last one, hot springs are a great reservoir for potential biotechnology and biofuel industry. The most prominent example for this is DNA polymerase, the TAC polymerase that a scientist called Thomas Brock found in uh, the organism Thermos aquaticus that he isolated from mushroom hot spring here in Yellowstone National Park, um, and in which a few years later um, isolated the DNA polymerase from on which the PCR, the polymerase chain reaction that we today use in labs worldwide to amplify DNA, um, has, is coming from. So not only did this discovery and the development of PCR 
um, was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1993, the production of this one enzyme, this one thermostable enzyme from this 70 degrees hot spring alone is a multi-billion dollar industry today, which shows that the potential for discovering new organisms in their enzymes and how they can be used for biotechnological purposes with tremendous potential for health and for the economy. As well, the best place to study microorganisms that are living in hot springs is just, you know, a one hour, 20 minutes drive south of Bozeman where I live in Yellowstone National Park that is just located at the intersection of the US states of Wyoming, Idaho and Montana. The park is about 3,500 square miles or about 9,000 square kilometers large. To give you an idea, this is larger than the states of Rhode Island and Delaware combined and is larger than several of the states in Germany or France, for example. So we're talking about a pretty big territory. Yellowstone National Park features um, about 14,000 geothermal features and is estimated to hold about 55% of all the world's geothermal features. And you see this map here that shows you, you know, the basic outline of Yellowstone National Park with a big lake in the center and then all these red and yellow and orange colors indicate the biggest geothermal feet, feet, um, fields excuse me, in the park. So where you have clusters of hot springs and geysers, basically. And these green circles that are numbered here are the main locations where my lab is currently uh, performing research. We said there's about 14,000 features, about 7,700 of them. So give or take about half of them have been logged, meaning we know where they are and we know what their temperature and pH is. What you see in this plot is the gray dots are 7,694 plots of every geothermal feature in Yellowstone National Park that has been locked. And on the x-axis you have the temperature and on the y-axis you have the pH. And so what we see, there's you know, a, a huge, huge diversity in terms of the, the temperature and the pH of the geothermal features. But one problem is that historically, researchers have focused on a, a few particular very particular sites of hot springs. One of them being very, very hot, so in the range of 80 to 90 degrees of boiling temperature with a very, very low pH, so very acidic features. In the other ones, you know, circumneutral around pH 6, 7-ish in a temperature of about 50 to 70 degrees Celsius. These features here have been mainly studied for the reason that they're, you know, they're so extreme that they can only host a very low diversity of microorganisms. In some of these features that are extremely hot and extremely acidic, you literally have like only three or four different species of microorganisms. Compare this to the soil I just talked about, where you have 100,000 species in one gram, right? This is a very simple community, which makes your experiments easier to conduct because you're only dealing with three or four species rather than 100,000. And these features in the center here have been mainly looked at because these are some of the most gorgeous features in the park. So this is a big problem I'll talk about in a minute. So after my lab was founded um, about three years ago, my lab has been conducting a very large survey of Yellowstone features, Yellowstone hot springs, um, to basically circumvent this problem that historically we only have looked at a very small portion of features in the park. And so all the red dots here are indicating hot springs in the park that my lab has sampled. And you see that, you know, we try to get a very a broader representation, basically, of all the features in the park to understand their geochemistry and the microbiological inhabitants. And so one of the things we found um, is that researchers are also humans and we are just drawn to beautiful, quote unquote, aesthetically pleasing sites. So many of the sites in this area that I pointed out before that are, you know, about circumneutral 50, 60, 70 degrees Celsius happen to be very colorful. And the reason for that is that at 70 degrees, just at the end of where this blue plot is here that I just showed you, pigments break down. So most of the colors that we typically see in many of those hot springs disappear. And so you are in this niche where you have brilliant, vibrant colors just before the pigments break down, which, you know, makes this hot springs are beautiful to look at. And so historically, a lot of researchers have focused on these gorgeous sites simply because they're nice to look at. And the problem is just a few meters away, there might be a hole in the ground, like shown here, that is basically a pit that is, you know, a meter in size that is filled with muddy water that also has about 60, 70 degrees Celsius 
you know, you see some gas bubbles forming here. And if you actually look into the microorganisms that live in one and the other hot spring, you learn that the ones in the left, in these gorgeous vibrant colors, are already known to science for a long time. Because researchers have been studying these for, you know, 50, 60, 70 years, since the 1960s when modern microbiology in Yellowstone National Park started. So from, you know, my very high standard as an environmental microbiologist, right, the organisms in the left are pretty boring. They are still pretty awesome, don't get me wrong, right? But in terms of their novelty, they are not really that interesting. We have, we, we know them for a long time. In turn, when we look at that hole in the ground, that is just dirty mud water at 70 degrees Celsius, we actually found so much new microorganisms in this small little pool here that the diversity of new phyla, of new lineages of microorganisms in this pond is larger than the entirety diversity of mammals on our planet combined in this one little mud pond. And so this shows you the tremendous potential that you know, we as microbiologists, as microbial ecologists in particular have when studying these diverse features. If you're interested, you can actually go online and watch um, Yellowstone live. Uh, the National Park Service of the United States has installed a webcam um, in the Geyser Valley um, at Old Faithful Inn, which is one of the you know, most prominent geysers in the world. And if you go to this address, or alternatively, you can just use your phone and scan this QR code, you can start the webcam and it will give you a live view 24 hours, 365 through the entire year that shows you a live view and you can actually watch the geysers in the park erupting. The National Park Service is nice enough to even provide you an update when the next time the eruption occurs. The next eruption of Old Faithful will happen at 2.56 p.m. plus minus 10 minutes. So I encourage you, if you're interested, go to this website, check when the next time Old Faithful is breaking out, be there a few minutes early and then see, you know, Old Faithful go off um, in Yellowstone National Park. It's, it's really tremendous. It's really a tremendous site. The last thing I want to mention is how do we study uh, microorganisms? So one of the things we do is we go to a hot spring and we basically, you know, take DNA from this sample, we obtain biomass and sequence the DNA of the microorganisms that are contained within there. Using this DNA, we then determine what is the genomic potential, what kind of reactions can the organism run? What are potential energy sources? What are carbon sources? And so on. And we then use different assays to test, are these processes actually happening in the hot spring? So for example, we observe whether certain gases that we predict can be produced by these microorganisms are in fact produced in this hot spring. We use sophisticated fluorescence microscopy techniques to visualize where the microorganisms are in the environment. How, and if and how, do they hang out with other cells? So this goes back to this friends and frenemies questions we had before. We run incubations directly in the hot springs to determine the biochemistry and the physiology of these orga organisms using some sophisticated uh, spectroscopic techniques. We sample multiple sites over Yellowstone National Park, not only in one feature, but you know, many features across the park, hundreds and hundreds of them, to get an idea of the biogeography of the organisms. So where are the organisms? And last, we then take all this information that we've gained from all these different experiments, right? And we try to grow them in the lab. Because there are certain things, right, that you can only do if you can actually grow the organisms in the lab, and maybe if you can genetically modify them right, to learn what this organism is actually doing on a genetic level. Well, and for that, we need to bring this into culture. And so with that, we think we combine the best of both worlds, right? We try to understand microorganisms exactly how they are in the environment using tests that do not depend on cultivation, that use microscopy techniques, field work, and so on. And then we also try to culture them. Once we think we've gained enough information in order to, you know, bring them into, um, into cultivation, into culture. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Um, if you're interested to learn more about our research, feel free to check out our lab website, environmental-microbiology.com. If you want to save time, you can also scan the QR code um, with your phone. You will land directly on our website to learn more about the people, the graduate students, the postdoc, and the staff scientists in my lab who are actually doing the research, our funding agencies, the specific questions we work on, 
and some other research that have nothing to do with Yellowstone National Park, but where we also study some um, as extremophiles in deep sea sediments um, and other organisms in salt marsh sediments. And with that, thanks for your attention and have a great rest of International Microorganism Day. Thanks.